When you're around as much music as I am, you tend to develop really eclectic musical styles, but I can't live without classic rock or blues. And because of music streaming, we all have lots of access to endless music. So I wanted to better understand how streaming platforms and their algorithms make music recommendations. I linked up with Steve Hogan. Steve heads up the Genome Music Project over at Pandora. Steve's team analyzes musical recordings and listener data making him just the guy to talk to to better understand the technology behind tailored music recommendations. What are we waiting for? Let's check out the conversation. All right, so we've got here Steve Hogan. What's up, Steve? How's it going, Marty? Yeah, good to see you, man. So you work at Pandora, and I'm sure most people out there are familiar with Pandora. I am the director of music analysis and I work on a project we call the Music Genome Project. Wow, that sounds really fancy. Now, one thing I know, Pandora, I feel like is kind of at the front lines of actually using science to figure out what people like. I've been with Pandora since 2000, so I'm coming on 22 wow. years. And I don't think I'm being cocky when I say that Pandora really was the pioneer in terms of like personalized, technology-driven music streaming. All of our recommendations came out of this music genome project that we do. We've had over the years probably 60, 70 different musicians here in the Bay Area that's, that have worked for us, and their job is to put headphones on and listen to songs one at a time and go pretty deep, like 10, maybe 15 minutes a song and really describe like the harmony, rhythm, melody, what key is it in, what's the tempo, what's the rhythmic meter, what instruments are in there. Okay, there's an electric guitar, how distorted or clean is that? Is it strumming? Is it playing a melodic riff? Is it playing a big long solo? We go very deep to capture all the details, like really a musical thumbprint of each song. Back in 2005, if you told us you liked Jack Johnson or you liked Celine Dion or whoever it is, we have all this detailed information about what makes that specific music click. And especially, I think it's easier to wrap your head around if you say a specific song. Let's say you like Old Man by Neil Young. You say, make me a station that's built around the musical features of Old Man by Neil Young. Then you're going to get the acoustic guitar, you'll get a little riff in, you know, maybe that similar tempo and feel, real straight ahead kind of groove. We know where Neil's vocal register is, maybe he's got a little more nasality in his voice. And we can look for songs um, that are kind of in the orbit of Old Man and just start stringing together a playlist for you. And then what's really been helpful to us is people can then say thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, I like that one. I don't like that one. And it's turned into this just absolute gold mine of data. Very cool. I was wondering the difference because you guys obviously have human involvement. So how much is, are you guys doing this based off of your own human group and how much is actually more like computer driven and, and I'm sure they relate and work together, right? Symbiotically? Absolutely, yes, it is very symbiotic. I've said it before, like the, it's pretty laborious process for my team to analyze, so we have to be choosy. A big part of our process is the prioritization. What songs do we want to spend this scarce resource on, which is the human being's attention. Because when we have a human analyze the song, that is definitely the gold standard understanding of that music. The machine learning side is right there too. It's learning from us every day and getting better at predicting, but the machines can only predict the qualities of the music to a certain level of confidence. You know, I might say, we think there's an acoustic guitar here, we're 70% sure. It's always better to have that human definitive understanding. Through prioritizing the music, I would say, you know, the vast majority of songs that play on Pandora have a human analysis behind it. Even though our entire playable collection of music, which is many tens of millions now. As a percentage of that total catalog of music, we've only hand analyzed a small percentage. So the machines are there to kind of fill in the details on those many, many millions of songs that we have not analyzed. But we've taken care to kind of analyze the most listened to music. 
What are some interesting discoveries that you've just made personally about people's musical habits that maybe you wouldn't have understood before using this kind of science? People's tastes around just high level sonority of the music. Do you like more organic sounding acoustic music or do you like that kind of more electronic sound on a radio head station on Pandora? We can really segment the listeners because Radiohead's a good example. They're like a three-headed beast. They've got some acoustic music, some really deep electronic sounding music and some more electric rock. We can really see that pattern with listeners. They gravitate to one or the other of those. So those are really useful. Because of all this mining the data and then looking at the data, I think it has changed artistry too. Yeah, I think the whole economics of being a music artist is so different now than it was when we were growing up. They have to be really savvy. We have tools on Pandora for the artist. They can come on and, and see on a map of the U.S. where are their listeners. You know, sometimes yeah. they're in these little pockets and maybe that informs where they want to go tour. They can, you wow. know, we can provide them some information about the musical qualities that <laughs> their music features that people seem to respond to. Let's go into a hypothetical here. Let's say, figure out what my listening style is. Tell me maybe some artists or specific songs, what would you choose? What would happen if I only picked the Beatles and the Meters? If you put them onto a single station, we would be playing sets of music based on one or the other. So at any given song that you'd hear would be tied to one or the other of those musical starting points. I mean, to be honest, like we have the Music Genome Project, which is very powerful at finding music that sounds like what you're after. But at this point, we have so much data about the Beatles and the meters even that we already know lists of probably thousands of songs that we know work for the vast majority of those fans. That's a strategy called collaborative filtering that you'll see on Amazon. People who bought this also bought X, Y, and Z. Those are very safe choices. But the, the beauty of the Music Genome Project is that it's actually blind to the popularity level. So it's really good at getting things that are off the radar. Let's say you're listening to this station with the Beatles and the Meters, you get Let It Be and you give it a thumbs up. The genome can say, oh, that has a very prominent piano and it's in a major key or even it's in the key of C major. If you thumb up a lot of songs that have piano and a major key, and in that tempo, now we got something to go on and we can grab other songs out there by other artists or whoever that are similar to that and try them out on you. So that would be one example of how to mine the music genome across any number of dimensions. Could be the instrumentation is common, the qualities of the vocalist are common. All that. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to just do a little sidebar or deep dive uh, into some of these song similarities that Steve was talking about. I've single-handedly analyzed lots of hit songs over and over. And one thing that comes to my mind, and it's really not a secret anymore, is this thing called the Access of Four Awesome Chords. It's a particular chord progression uh, that we hear in dozens, hundreds, even thousands of popular songs. You can play it in different keys, but it sounds like this when it's just the basic chords. <laughs> So that could be The Beatles' Let It Be, it could be No Woman No Cry by Bob Marley, it could be With or Without You by U2. They actually are all using that progression. And you can take that and even make it a pop punk song with that same progression. Same chords. Now another thing that, that could connect songs together are tempos. That's how fast the song is. You're also gonna have time signatures. That's something that they analyze as well. That's interesting because most pop music, popular music is in a 4-4 time signature. We, we like that pattern, we can follow it. But there is a very uplifting feel. And let's say the, you know, the first one that comes to my mind is uh, Piano Man by Billy Joel, but it's got a waltz 
feel to it. And so that time signature is three, four. So instead of, you know, one, two, three, four, it's in counts of three. And it gives you a different feel that some people enjoy and it makes them feel a certain way, even if they're not uh, consciously aware of it. So a waltz or a three, four type of feel is Norwegian Wood by the Beatles. Now I won't play that, but I'll play a waltz and you can hear that one, two, three, one, two, three. So now we're back to four. I'm going to go back to three now. One, two, three, one, two, three. All these characteristics affect how we interpret music and eventually influence our decisions on if we like or dislike a song. What was your life, life like before digital? Can you imagine all this stuff happening? Not really. It's funny that I have a 13 year old son and he's gotten really into cassettes now. It's, <laughs> yeah. I think it's a new thing coming up. I'm really interested actually in, for the younger generation today, their experience of pop music, I feel like it crosses generational boundaries way more easily than for me. When I grew up listening to the classic rock station in the late 80s, 90s, that was my view into music. And now all these streaming yeah. services like Pandora and others, they don't really distinguish between music from the 80s yeah. or current music. You know, they're, they're a lot more open. I do see that difference now with my kids. They can listen to anything. There's no limitations. And it's actually all classic now. Yeah, it's weird. What does it even mean to be an oldie now? In the 80s, the oldies actually sounded very old and from another era. You know, music from the right. 40s, 50s, even earliest 60s music. Now there's music that's 50 years old that's from the 70s that was recorded like really hi-fi and sounds awesome. All right, I just want to thank you again, Steve Hogan, for your time and the stimulating conversation. I'm going to be thinking about this stuff after I go to bed tonight. So thank you again. Thank you, Marty. I really enjoyed talking with you. I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, hopefully we'll hang together in uh, Northern California sometime and do some jamming. Hell yeah. All right, All right man, right, thanks thank again. You. Wow, human music analysts and machine learning working to catalog the world's music. As a musician myself, I can't help but get excited by the implications of the huge data set that Steve was talking about. Exploring music through its structural characteristics or popular song elements feels like a fun way to get inspired when songwriting. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us. For more videos like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel right now and ring the bell notification to make sure you don't miss any great content and look for Curiosity Stream on social media. Links are in the description.